Today we start a new chapter, chapter three, aggregate loss models. Um, chapter one, we started uh, loss frequency or claim frequency. Uh, chapter two, we started uh, claim civility. In this chapter, we are going to combine those two concepts together to study the aggregate loss. Uh, in that sense, the fundamentals are chapter one, chapter two. Uh, this new chapter is somehow built on top of these two, uh, the previous two chapters. So uh, if we assume the, uh, the most important things are well understood from the previous two chapters, uh, then we should have a relatively easy journey in, in this chapter. Uh, but I should mention that um, SOA likes to test the questions from chapter three uh, a lot more than chapter one, chapter two. So uh, from that angle, this is really an important chapter. Uh, here we have a quick learning objectives. Uh, all of you need to know what is an individual risk model, what is a collective risk model, and uh, uh, the the common part and the different parts of, uh, of these two models, okay? Those are really, really the uh, building blocks of um, short-term actuarial mathematics. Uh, the de Perel recursion is, well, as long as you know the concept, I think that's usually enough. Uh, the compound process, this is actually not new. We, we, we first uh, met this concept actually in chapter one, right? So this is a, uh, so basically you are trying to sum up. So uh, here we have, a, we have a new interpolation of n and x than those in chapter one, uh, but the mathematical part is it's nearly the same. Uh, we will learn some approximation models. Uh, that's really hopeful. And uh, um, the most important one is actually normal approximation. Uh, again, something we did in exam one. Uh, stop loss B insurance. Uh, this is a uh, quite interesting concept, uh, but uh, you will see uh, it's, it's highly similar to deductible. Okay. So uh, without any further ado, let's, uh, let's begin the introduction of individual risk models. Uh, we will have some, let's call them uh, default setup, meaning uh, in, in basically this chapter, uh, we will use X or Y to denote the loss of a policy. And uh, we use lower index to usually call it the ICE policy or the ICE policy holder. So here we have N policy holders uh, going from X1 to XN. Uh, the default assumption is that they are ID. So basically, whenever we have XI, we assume they are ID. So they are independent and identically distributed to random variables, okay? Uh, of course, that's, um, that's quite a simplification and uh, uh, often it's not the case to the practice, uh, but somehow it gives us a quick idea or somehow nice mathematics to work with. Uh, that is the reason why we always start with IID assumptions on the axis, okay? Uh, individual risk model is nothing but this simple summation. Uh, let's, let's analyze, okay? Uh, let's go to the actual model and analyze. Uh, collective, we will come back, of course. Uh, here we have some quick remarks as, you know, why we uh, start up those two models for the aggregate. Uh, but I found those somehow you know, unnecessary because it's simply obvious, right? How, how do you model aggregate, right? Let's say uh, you own a company or you are the chief actuary of an insurance company. Uh, your company just sold 1,000 auto policies. How are you going to figure out the claims, right? You can, you can check policy by policy. There are 1,000 policies, right? You, 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 you build 1,000 models for, for each one and sum them up, then you know uh, the aggregate amount your company is supposed to pay in the next uh, six months, right? So that's, that's, that's a very trivial idea. That's basically the individual risk model. So let's interpret in, uh, the 
actual setup of individual risk models. So small n, you can think it as number of policies or number of policy holders. Okay. Uh, it can be a pool of the same type of policies or not, right? It depends on you. Uh, usually we would like to interpret uh, N as the number of policies that are somehow homogeneous. Like for instance, we don't want to mix auto policy with home policies because uh, then it's somehow unreasonable to assume the all the access are ID, right? But you know, if you have somehow a homogeneous policies, let's say we study uh, auto policies on on cars that uh, are valued less than let's say twenty five thousand dollars, then you know those policies uh, probably are close, similar, or somehow homogeneous in risk factors uh, that helps us to group them together to study them as a as a group, right? So. Uh, but anyway, we can think small n as number of policy is a constant. That is the important thing. Uh, this n is a constant. Okay, uh, is known to us. Okay, uh, that's obvious, right? So if you are the chief actuary, you know how many policies your company sold within each category. So. Uh, that is the interpretation of n. Once we know n, then xi is obvious, right? So xi is the loss of the i's policy or the i's policy holder, right? So uh, if you want to know the aggregate, or uh, if we want to know the, the, the total loss of this group, all you need to do is to sum up over all axes, right? Because there are n of them we sum up from x1 to xn, then you get aggregate. The default notation for aggregate is s. So s is the aggregate, small n is the number of policies, x1, x2, all the way to xn, those are the loss of uh, each policy, and then we add them up, okay? Uh, n is fixed, it's a constant, and because we assume those axes are id, uh, the next two results are, uh, you know, are very obvious, right? So we can easily derive this result because uh, all the axes are ID. We use this condition, we get uh, 3.3. Uh, so here somehow we put to say X is a mixed type. Mixed type, which means it has discrete and continuous components, right? So you may have well, you, you, in this case, well, we don't need to even talk about the general uh, mixed type random variables. This is a special case. Uh, we will have a probability mass at zero. Okay, so your probability at zero is strictly greater than zero. Okay, uh, the reason is simple, right? Because we use X to model the loss of the ICE policy. Let's say we consider auto policy. It is possible that the ICE policy holder is a fantastic driver he or she does not incur any accidents within six months. Then his or her claim or loss xi would be zero, right? Because nothing happens for, for this particular policy holder, right? So uh, for that reason, we have a probability mass at zero. Beyond zero, uh, we usually use a continuous distribution to model. Uh, that is what we did in chapter two. Right, we apply a continuous distribution to model the claim severity. Right, so if something happens, we would like to use a continuous distribution to model the size. That is the reason why our X is a mixed type. Right, so now we introduce uh, theta to be the probability of loss. So here it's actually one minus theta. Right, the probability of no loss would be one minus theta. That is exactly the probability that x equals zero. Uh, when there is a loss, we introduce another random variable, which we call y, to denote the size of the loss, right? So y is bigger than zero, uh, meaning something bad already happened. And uh, uh, we want to use a random variable y or distribution y to model the size of this loss, okay? Uh, it's a positive continuous random variable and uh, 
uh, we use mean, mu y, and uh, sigma y squared to denote its variance. Those are standard notations. So 3.4 is uh, it's a useful identity, right? So let's take a look why this is the case. Uh, we know, uh, so first, what is this i? i is a Bernoulli random variable, okay? And uh, we use this Bernoulli random variable to somehow mark whether a policy uh, comes back with a claim or not. So this is no claim, uh, or this is claim. So theta means there is a claim, or some claims, this is no claim. So uh, the use of this Bernoulli random variable i uh, is to record whether a particular policy results in a claim or not. If it comes back with a claim or more than one claim, uh, we use one to mark this random variable. So one means the, the insurance company is going to receive a claim from this policy. Right? Zero means no claim from this policy. So uh, that helps us to mark, right? Because if i is zero, then we don't care about y, right? Because uh, in that case, x is zero, right? We don't need to care about uh, the policies. Uh, we don't need to uh, actually study the modeling of, of claims for policies that are clean, right? So uh, once i is zero, when i is zero, x is zero. When i is one, x equals y, right? i equals one means, you know, something happened. In that case, we use y to model the size of the loss. And uh, obviously in this case, y and x are the same. So from here, we easily see this identity, right? Uh, this identity is mathematically useful uh, because uh, we usually assume i and uh, y are independent. So i and y are independent. Okay. Uh, in most scenarios, this is a rather a reasonable assumption because you know i is a random variable that uh, captures whether an accident happens, right? And y is the size of an accident, right? So usually it's reasonable to assume they are independent. Uh, with that in mind, this is, this is trivial, right? I and Y are independent. And if you take expectation on the product of two independent random variables, you simply separate, right? So the expectation of product equals the product of expectation. So uh, this is simple. Um, the expectation of, of I is obviously theta, right? So we have the first result. Uh, variance is slightly more complicated. The textbook asks us to use some uh, formulas. Uh, basically, that's the uh, conditional, uh, conditional variance formula. Uh, so basically, what they want you to do is this. So I give you two methods. Method one. Method one is, is the one used in the textbook. Okay. Uh, so what they want you to do is uh, we can write it in conditional expectation. Okay, uh, conditioning on i. So we have this. So I use this somehow, you know, curly uh, or somehow fancy v to denote uh, variance. Right. So this is a somehow a symmetrical formula. Symmetrical means uh, left hand side is the unconditional variance. On the right hand side, if you read, it would be the expectation of the conditional variance plus the variance of the conditional expectation. Right. So E and V, they, they switch position. That's why I call this somehow a symmetrical uh, formula. Uh, then you, you work out for, for each one. Okay. Um, for instance, uh, the inside part, it is actually uh, the variance of y uh, because we know x equals i times y, okay? On the right-hand side, I'm going to use i times y to replace x. And uh, here is the expectation of y times i. 
again, let me uh, emphasize one more time that conditional expectation is a way of creating a new random variable, a random variable of condition. So what you can think of is when you take conditional expectation or conditional variance, what you do is you actually apply a function, let's call it f, to your condition. For instance, in this case, what you apply is a constant times the condition, a constant times the condition squared. So that's what you get. And then, of course, you can get the result. Uh, this is not a good method. Actually, this is uh, something we can easily get the result. Uh, we, we want to know the variance, right? And we, we already know the mean, which means uh, we just need to calculate the second moment. Right, we know x is i times y. i and y are independent. Applying any function on those two, you still remain uh, the independency condition. So they are still independent. Okay, uh, the expectation of i square, which is the same as y, uh, as i. And then you can, uh, if you want, you can write it as uh, mean squared plus variance. That is your second moment, right? And then use this minus uh, the square of your, um, the square of your expectation, then you would get the same result. Uh, method two is, is actually easier. So we have uh, 3.6, I believe, 3.6 and 3.7, okay? Uh, those two are really, really important formulas, okay? Uh, we, if we want to apply normal approximation, we need them to tell us what is mean, what is variance, okay? Uh, we have example 3.1. Assume there's a chance of 0 0.1 that there's a claim. So theta is 0 0.2. When a claim occurs, the loss is exponentially distributed with parameter uh, 0 0.5. Uh, this is our notation. Uh, we will see um, what, what that means. Uh, in our notation, lambda is it's, uh, it's not the mean. Found the mean and variance of the claim distribution. Suppose there are 500 independent policies. Compute the mean and the variance of aggregate. So we simply apply the previous formulas to, to finish this example. Uh, first, that is what I meant uh, previously by our notation. Uh, in, in the notation of this book, the mean of uh, exponential is one over the parameter. So if the parameter value is 0 0.5, uh, mean is two, okay? And the similarly, variance is one over the square of the parameter. So uh, you should get two and four instead of 0 0.5 or 0 0.25. Uh, once we know that, you simply apply. So this is, a, this is an easy uh, example. Uh, the, ne the next one we are trying to study is, um, is more complicated uh, because, you know, in, in this case, what we are trying to do is, is we, we summarize, right? We summarize over n iid random variables. Uh, in, in probability, we call this convolution, right? Because you are summing up the same copy of a iid random variable series. So that's why we call this convolution. Uh, we just derived the mean and variance of this particular distribution. Uh, but in general, knowing the mean and variance is not enough unless we have a normal distribution. For a normal distribution, once you know mean and you know variance, you have a unique normal distribution. Or if you have uh, exponential, if you know mean, you know everything. Or you, if you know variance, you know everything. So usually for those parametric distributions, uh, mean and variance are likely enough if you have a two parameter distribution. Uh, with those two, you establish two equations where you should be able to find out the exact values of your parameters. Let's say you have a Pareto. If you have mean and variance, you can go backwards to calculate um, your alpha and the gamma. But in general, it's not true, right? We don't know. We don't know the distribution of this S, right? It's, it's likely not a normal distribution or gamma or beta or anything we know. 
In that case, knowing the mean and the variance gives us some information, but not the complete information, right? It would be nice if we know the exact distribution of S. That is something we are trying to work out. Uh, we, we, obviously, we only have a partial solution to this question. Uh, it, uh, it highly depends on the setup. So let's, let's begin with the easiest, okay? The easiest one would be x1 plus x2. You have two policies. Uh, of course, if you only have one policy, there's no need to study, right? So the distribution of x is the distribution of s. Now let's begin with twofold, x2, x1 plus x2. Uh, the PDF of x1 plus x2 is given by 3.8. Um, again, you know, it is PDF. Uh, usually when we talk about PDF, we, we implicitly mean uh, it's a continuous random variable. For a continuous random variable, the probability of it equaling any single value is zero. So uh, although it may help you to understand it uh, as follows, let's say we want the summation to be equal to x. How are you going to make that happen? You pick any value for x2. Let's say we pick y for x2. It must be between zero and x, right? Because we are talking about loss. It's, it's always non-negative. So uh, you pick a value for the second one for x2. Let's say we pick y. y is obviously between zero and x. Once you select y, then x1 would be x minus y, right? Uh, but of course, this is, uh, this is actually an incorrect reasoning, but uh, uh, it helps you understand the meaning of this, this formula, right? The correct way, uh, the correct way mathematically is to uh, use the uh, CDF. So let's let's assume, uh, let's assume both are continuous. Then the summation obviously is also continuous, right? So this means x1 plus x2 less than x. Okay. Uh, again, because I assume, because I assume this is a uh, uh, both are continuous random variables have the same, uh, we don't even need to assume they have the same distribution. Let's say F1, F2 are their PDF. So uh, what, what do we have down here? So we have X1 plus X2. So usually what you can do is, let's say here's X1, here's X2. Okay, so let's say this is X. It's, uh, So let's draw this. Okay, so this, this point is x, this is point is x. Okay, uh, we have x1 plus x2. So this is the, the straight line. So x1 plus x2 less than x would be everything inside this shaded uh, triangle area, right? So what can you do? Uh, so let's consider x2, right? They are the same. So x2, it goes from zero to x, right? And once you, uh, once you have the, the, once you select the value, then you know uh, what you are supposed to, to get, right? Um, so once you select X2 as somehow down here, so let's use the same color. Okay. So once you select X2, you know, this is the, let's say somehow between uh, zero and X, uh, your x1 will go from 0 to x minus the value of x2. Uh, let's use random variable y to denote. Uh, let's, let's use z. Okay. Otherwise, we have two x's. So this is z, this is z. Okay. Uh, so once I pick a value for x2, my x1 will stay between zero and this point. By right? this point will be z minus y. Because adding them together, I get z. Okay, so this straight line is, uh, this straight line is x1 plus x2 equals z. Okay. Uh, then I just need to write down the, uh, so technically it's the, uh, this, uh, called the, the joint distribution. Uh, but because we assume they are independent, right? So this is x1, x, f2, y, okay? So f1, f2, y. 
dx dy. So now I want to know the PDF. Right? In order to get the PDF, I just need to uh, differentiate. Right? I just need to differentiate, then I will get the, uh, the answer of it. So that's, that's, uh, that's the technical step you do to, uh, the next step is to, to differentiate. Uh, of course, you can, well, if you want, you can, uh, you can write this one more step. Uh, if you want to do the inside part, that is f1, d minus y, f2, y, dy. Okay, um, then you can easily get uh, the result of it uh, by differentiating, right? The inside part, if you uh, remember here, we need to differentiate with respect to z. We have z here, uh, we have z on the up point, we also have z down there, okay? Uh, but it's 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 really straightforward. All you need to do is um, um, let me actually do it here. So f x plus one. So I use z instead of x. Okay. So when I differentiate this, I get one, and then I need to plug in z for y. So I get f one as zero, f two as z. So this is zero, right? Because my random variable is no negative. Uh, then I need to uh, differentiate the, the inside part with respect to z. Uh, when I differentiate, I get f1, z minus, uh, then here I need to keep this, obviously. And then I need to decide, uh, differentiate the inside part. Uh, the CDF becomes PDF. The constant remains. It's a function of y or the function of z. We differentiate with respect to z. Uh, then if you want, you can put it back to x. That's, uh, that's the formula we have done here, okay? Uh, but you know, just uh, using the PDF or using the probability at that point might help you uh, understand the meaning of this formula. Uh, of course, once you get twofold, you can, you can apply the same concept many times, right? M minus one times, then you get the m-fold. Uh, that is the, somehow the mathematical part of it, right? So this is um, mathematical induction. Uh, sometimes, you know, our x may be mixed type, like the one we have in, in the individual case, uh, individual risk model case, uh, then it's slightly more complicated, right? But the, in general, uh, the, the understanding should be straightforward, right? We do twofold and then we move forward. And if you have, uh, the, the difference between continuous and uh, and uh, discrete is for continuous you do summation for discrete you do uh, uh, for continuous you do integral for discrete you do summation we already mentioned that earlier on in in chapter one so uh, we do have an example here um, it's um, it's actually not easy it's uh, uh, it requires a lot of computation and uh, uh, I don't think you can really compute by hands. Uh, you can, but it will take you really uh, a long time. So this is somehow uh, a programming question. Uh, it's, it's a good exercise though. Let's take a look. Uh, we have something, the same setup from example 3.1. So X is, uh, or Y is uh, exponential. Uh, we want to know the uh, distribution of uh, the aggregate from 100 to 300 in steps of 10. Uh, by the way, if you apply normal approximation, that's very easy, right? We already know the mean and the variance. Well, you just need to do the standardization, right? Minus the mean divided by the standard deviation, then, and then look for the table. So that's the uh, easy method. Now we take a different one, okay? Uh, the first step we do is, is we discretize this continuous because we know this is exponential, right? Exponential is actually a continuous distribution. Uh, we are trying to uh, separate this into 11 different values uh, from zero, one, all the way to 10. Uh, it's somehow, well, you know, there's no algorithm here to see uh, why we picked 10, right? So if you look at the, the value, uh, you probably will find that um, uh, 10 is rather sufficient because the probability now is very small, right? It's getting smaller, you know, if you, if you choose uh, way bigger values, right? Though the values in general, I mean, they are not exactly decreasing, uh, but somehow they are on a decreasing trend, right? So uh, 
the most probability is actually placed at uh, at zero. That's not surprising, right? Because most uh, uh, short-term policies uh, they come back clean, right? So uh, it's right. It's it's, um, it's not that often to have uh, claims from a particular policy. So here. Uh, about 85% uh, of the time, a policy will come back clean, will not come back with any claims. So uh, this is the formula we used to uh, discretize uh, the exponential distribution into a discrete version. Okay, uh, you can take a look at uh, at, at this. Okay. So once you once you have done that, so here what we we do is uh, we convert from is the exponential to this particular, this is a discrete, this is a discrete random variable, a discrete distribution, right? Originally we have a continuous one, we convert it or somehow we, uh, we approximate it by a discrete distribution uh, in this table, okay, by the formulas in the previous slide. Uh, next uh, we apply the convolution method. So, uh, we we con we do the convolution. This is the result. Uh, it's um, it's it's not well. It's it's not easy to compute. Uh, you will need to write a program. Uh, it, you can use R. You can use MATLAB. It's uh, it's that doesn't matter. Uh, in 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 this case, uh, you have discrete distribution. Uh, you have discrete distribution down here, right? Uh, let me, let me just give you a brief idea, you know, how, how, you, how you proceed. Uh, let's begin with x1 plus x2, right? So first of all, you need to figure out uh, the, all the possible values, right? So it will go from zero all the way to 20, right? Zero means zero plus zero. x1, zero, x2, zero, how do you calculate the probability? They are independent. Right. Okay, one. One can be zero plus one or one plus zero. So uh, we will use zero times one, zero point zero six thirteen. Uh, the next one, uh, they have the same probability, so a times by two. Right. So how about two? Two zero plus two or one plus one or Two plus zero, so you compute the probability for three scenarios. Uh, it's possible to do this by hand, right? But uh, it will take uh, uh, maybe days to to complete because uh, how many how many policies we have? We have five hundred, right? So I I I what I just showed is twofold. You need to do five hundred fold. That's why uh, it's. It's, it's nearly impossible to do it by hand. Uh, you will need to some uh, computing uh, power to do that. Uh, here's the results, but the idea I, I, I just gave you, right? Once you have the twofold, you add to X3, then X3 goes from zero to 30, right? That's the, the, the mathematical analysis, it's, it's not complicated. It's just the competition is crazy. Uh, then we talk about something that's uh, that's more friendly to us. Uh, when n is large, uh, it's, it's safe to apply normal approximation by central limit theorem from the probability side. So once this is true, then, we, then it's really easy, right? So if we want to know the probability that uh, the aggregate is below some value, we simply apply standardization minus the mean divided by the standard deviation then we will get a standard normal n zero one we have the table for it right it's very easy to get a result uh this is uh usually the type of question i will ask you or soa will ask you soa will not will never ask you even tenfold right twofold is somehow reasonable right threefold is the maximum i don't think they will go beyond three right? so as long as you understand uh, the mathematics behind it, there's no need for you to do everything. Maybe I will ask you on a particular choice. Let's say I want to know the probability of twofold equals six. Right? You need to get me all the scenarios starting from zero plus six, one plus five, two plus four, three plus three, four plus two, etc. Right? Uh, I will not ask you crazy questions. Uh, 
I think that's everything for individual. So I will stop here and uh, continue in the next video for collective, which is arguably more complicated.